Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this virtual bourbon event. My name is Steve Akeley. I own a company called the ABV Network, and we're talking to Mr. Jason Bronner today about a pick that he did with uh, New Riff, and we're going to be getting into that as well as Jason's career in bourbon. So it should be a fun event. Uh, we will leave time at the end for Q&A where you can ask Jason anything about uh, his business, the bourbon industry, really anything you like, the people of bourbon. But uh, again, this is your meeting. Feel free to ask questions at any time, whether it is jumping in, no problem at all. It's a relatively small group. Or if you prefer the chat function, I will keep my eye on it, though I don't necessarily jump to those right away. I'll get to you when, I, when we can. Uh, the exciting thing about this is I do want to tell you right up front, the bottles should go out next week. I'll be getting Jason uh, his check. Uh, and uh, we don't send them out in advance because we don't get paid from Eventbrite right away. But uh, once we get that, we'll uh, get to your bottles sent your way. So should be cool. A rare opportunity to wherever you're at in the country to be able to get a bottle from Bourbon's Bistro. Yeah. With that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jason Bronner. Jason, how you doing, man? Doing well. Hey, folks. Um, glad you guys can join us tonight. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to be talking about the pick, kind of the star of the show in just a second here. Before we get to that, Jason, there are a lot of new faces on here, and I don't know that everybody knows who you are. Uh, so if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I have a face made for radio, first thing. <laughs> this is true. Me too. No, uh, you know, I've been in the, uh, I started in the restaurant business when I was 21. I opened my first restaurant when I was 21, little pizza joint. Uh, wanted to move on to bigger and brighter things. Wanted to open up more of a full service restaurant and needed a backdrop for that. So this was around 2000. A uh, buddy of mine were sitting around drinking whiskey, smoking cigars, and um, said we should call it Bourbons. And after doing some research, I was going to do Bourbon Steakhouse, but I thought that kind of backed me into a corner. So I did Bourbons Bistro after studying about bourbon and uh, what the French have had influence on Kentucky, on Louisville on our culture, a little bit, the food and the bourbon industry. So uh, we decided to call it Bourbon's Bistro. And uh, I call it, you know, kind of upscale Southern cooking, four star food and a three and a half star joint because I'm kind of a laid back guy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, really got into bourbon. I took my uh, first class from, uh, we were going through some adult education classes, my wife and I, uh, Bellarmine, uh, which is a local college here in 2000, I think it was. And I ended up taking a bourbon class from Mike Veach, who's uh, one of my good friends now. He's, you know, an author, writer, knows more about bourbon than I would ever think about knowing, but, but just kind of really got the bug after taking his class. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it was a fairly long class of several weeks and, um, and we've been friends ever since. And I told him I was opening up a bourbon restaurant and uh, he's been a big fan ever since. So, I mean, it's just, that brings us to 2005 when I opened, you know, I always kind of tell people that um, we were doing bourbon before it was cool. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, if you think about what you were doing in 2005, if it had anything to do with bourbon, I don't know, but um Anyhow, it just, it, it really stuck with me. And the more I get into it, the more I realize I don't know about it and the more I still want to learn about it. But uh, that's kind of long and short of it. We've uh, had a lot of great fans like you guys out here and uh, Steve and throughout the 15 years I've been here, uh, kind of one of the first bourbon bar restaurants in the country, maybe in the world, I don't know. Um, I know there's a lot of whiskey you know, bars that opened up, but uh, we were out to educate the world about bourbon is, is really what, what the long and short of it was. Once I got the bug, it's like everybody needs to know about this because I love the history of Kentucky and I kind of grew up around bourbon. My um, great aunts and uncles have actually worked at National Distillery, which is in the neighborhood I grew up in. And so we got it kind of honestly, you know, we would be little kids and they'd be sitting at the card table and I'd have to go make them a drink and it would be 
you know, three fingers of old crow and a little bit of Canada dry. Um, you know, make it a highball. What's a highball? Well, that's what it is. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it just, uh, it, it's just a passion of mine. I, I enjoy it and I enjoy the family that comes with it and, and, and all the new people that are joining. It's really cool. I mean, we were embraced from the get go from all the big distilleries. We did bourbon dinners and uh, everybody's been through here, you know, and sat down and had dinner with Julian and uh, I mean, Rob or, you know, you name it, Bill Samuels, uh, uh, Eddie Russell, Jimmy Russell, uh, the Freddie or Fred, they call him Fred now. We used to call him Freddie before Freddie was Freddie. And that's confusing. But, um, you know, they've, they've, they've all been through here and, and, and accepted us from the get go. So it's a really cool uh, industry to be in. I, I, I really enjoy it. So bourbon bars today are so common. It's as you hear bourbon's beast, you think, yeah, there's another bourbon bar. But again, you were the first, first one to have bourbon in your name to focus exclusively on bourbon, not necessarily first whiskey bar, as you said, there's, that's been around forever, but to focus on bourbon specifically, yes. And even before you were open, uh, you know, this, this relationship you had with Mike Veach, a Kentucky bourbon hall of famer, uh, again, noted author and uh, really a historian. Um, he used to come in the bar right from the get-go and you guys even collaborated on him writing tasting, tasting notes for all, all of your inventory that you had at that time. Correct. And that, that's gotta be worth seeing. I wish we could dig that up and kind of run through those, you know, uh, and, and check out what his thoughts were about some of these older products now. You know, I, I don't know when Mike's first, you know, when he was first published with, with, I, I know a couple of his books, uh, they were published after the fact, but I didn't know if he had anything before that, but uh, he came, he would come in about once a week and would sample and I, I paid him with whiskey to do tasting notes and we call it the Bible and it's a, a huge thick binder and there's got to be 150 bourbons in there that he is, I, I'm going to call it his first work of, <laughs> uh, you know, that we've got written down, but he, uh, you know, come in once a week, he would buy dinner and then I would, I would take care of his drinks and, and he would uh, analyze it and write it all down. And we've got that somewhere around here. It's called the, it's called the bourbon Bible. That that's really cool. And, you know, let's not overstate, you know, how much of, you know, contributions you've made to the, uh, to the bourbon industry. I mean, you know, the first bourbon bar, that's, that's cool. But also what are, what does that mean? But you've, you did things like right out of the gate, you were doing dinners that uh, master distillers and company owners, again, the people that you're talking about, Julian Van Winkle would come in and do uh, do a dinner talking about, you know, Pappy Van Winkle and things like that. Uh, you guys did that literally from the beginning, something that is again, pretty commonplace now, but back then, uh, you know, mid late nineties, that wasn't done. Well, and we wanted to showcase, I think we were one of the first ones to, you know, really kind of put it out there as cooking with bourbon and, and, and how it complements and goes well with it. And we would do, um, we would do four bourbons and we'd do a five course dinner. So, you know, it was kind of showcasing our chef's ability uh, to work with the product and then also how it paired with things. So, you know, we, we've done hundreds of those we did one a month and we would do a different distiller every month uh and we just sell them out you know and then we just kind of stopped doing them because we had done so many of them and bourbon was getting popular and everybody was traveling and everybody i guess everybody else wanted their time so um we've thought about getting back into it maybe do one one or two a year but i don't know we'll see yeah some of those early stories about the excess of things, the excess of people's time, where you could get them at once a month, for, you know, every calendar month, boom, 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 you get another big bourbon celebrity in there uh, before everyone else starts pulling at their time. Uh, one of my other favorite stories too, is as we're getting into the holiday season now, what did you used to make your famous eggnog with? What was, what was your key bourbon that you would always use to make that eggnog? Well,
just want to let everybody know that, uh, you know, Steve stole my eggnog recipe. <laughs> I did. Do not let him claim it as his own. It's like I, him and what is that for? I, I famously won Best of Missouri with that eggnog. No, he made it for everybody for uh, his, I guess his dad's birthday last year. Um, yes. The yeah, celebration yeah. that he has for his dad, he made it for everybody and it's, yep. it's delicious. I did win best of Missouri eggnog with that uh, two years ago when they had the contest. So yeah, we well, were just I talking about that when you got kicked off. <laughs> yes, I best trust, in the state. I, I trust him to spread the love and, and not the recipe. So. <laughs> yes, I have not shared the recipe. No one can say they got the recipe for me because I haven't given it out. So. It's at the Missouri State Fair. No, <laughs> it's not. So, uh, Jason, you know, we talked about that. Some of the other things, too. I, I mean, again, it almost seems rudimentary to think about, but you had a wine background, and something that wasn't done at that time was, you know, bourbon flights. And that's one of the things that you also started with that background that you had. And uh, again, it's something now that is so commonplace. You, you can't go into a bourbon bar without that. But again, you guys were the first to do it. Yeah, we did. Uh just I, I did have a little bit of wine background just from being in the restaurant industry and 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 you know enjoyed doing wine flights with different foods and things and cheeses and so we, we why couldn't we do it with bourbon because you know like I said once I got into it and when I do a lot of my talks I talk you know is there any wine people who might be new to bourbon in the group and I say it's it, it's similar to wine you know, if you, if I ask you what type of wine do you drink, you just don't say red, you know, you say a cab or a Pinot and I say, that's just like bourbon, you know, Pinot's a real light red and then a cab's a real heavy red and there's everything in between. And that's just like bourbon. It's the same thing. There's, there's light bourbons, there's heavy bourbons and there's everything in between. So, uh, I thought what better to do a flight plus, you know, we had 130 something bourbons at the time. And how was I going to get people to taste, you know, taste them all, you know, to educate them about what's good and what's not. And that's, you know, hey, just try a little sip of this. So, and try it against this, you know, I, I think the, the linear flight is, is the best way to, to taste bourbon because you can pit one against the other. Like people don't do that at home or they do now, but they didn't, you know, to where you'd have to, and, and then, you know, it saves people money. You don't have to go out and buy a $50 bottle of bourbon to see what it tastes like. You can come in, uh, you know, get a, get a shot or get a flight and, and pit it up against something else and really hone in on what you like. So once again, it just drops back, Steve, to uh, people being educated about it. Uh, we just try to, we get people walking in and going, give me your most expensive bourbon or give me the Pappy 23. And it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to talk to the customer and, and see what they normally drink and, and then try to almost really talk them out of it. Talk them. I, I want them to get educated. So what brings us together today is a barrel pick for New Riff. But uh, before we get into the you know logistics of how all that works, and you can explain that and tell us a little bit about the pick that everybody will be getting a bottle of. Uh, you, again, you were a leader in that too. Uh, again, almost every bourbon bar of any substance now is going to do barrel picks. But you literally, and like I was in Four Roses, you were the first you know, on-premise location to do one with Four Roses. And uh, there's many other like that as well. You, know, you, were, you were a guy who was sitting around in a bar thinking, why can't I buy barrels of this? And so you start making phone calls. So tell us a little bit about how you got the idea you wanted to buy barrels and how you had to go about doing this when really there weren't programs to allow you to do that at that time. Well, actually, we did a, a thing today. It's uh, the Bourbon Redneck. We did a fireside check, which will come out on Monday. Uh, the, the first barrel we ever did was a Woodford barrel. And they say it's a single barrel, but it's really not. <laughs> You, you take two you take two barrels and blend them into one and you get about 200 bottles of it 
but the thing we did with the Woodford barrel is, is we got them to do it non-chill filtered. Now, Woodford's chill filtered because brown foreman, when they add ice, they want it to look perfectly clear. They don't want it to look cloudy uh, with the non-chill filtering. So even, I think we were ahead of our time about that is we were probably one of the first people at Woodford to do it. Like I said, this is around 2005, 2006. And I knew enough at the time to get it non-chill filtered. And, and I would do blind tastes with customers at our bar. And I would say this, this is, you know, their Woodford against our Woodford and our Woodford won probably 90% out of the time. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, because of that, that extra flavor, you know, that's, that's maybe a whole nother class on the, on the non-chill filter. But, you know, we were the second overall person. Uh, there was a, there was a store that did a four roses pick, uh, like a, a retail store, but we were the second people uh, to ever do a pick down there. And I've done 25 barrels here. Yeah. So that's, that's, you know, and, and I always love four roses because they were the only ones that let you do it barrel strength. Like the others I call bottle strength, which is like say Knob Creek is 120, uh, you know, Russell's reserve is 110. So I call those bottle strengths, you know, uh, but, but four roses, what you tasted out of the barrel is what you got. I think one of the highest ones I got out of there was, 134 proof which was unreal <laughs> jim gave me a bunch of shit about it he's like you know this was early on he's like you bourbon guys bourbon boys you you like that high proof stuff i said man that you know that's where all the flavor is you know i mean that's that's i think you know if you add a bunch of water to it you just add a bunch of water to it you're not adding this is the raw flavor and i'm kind of a purist when it comes to that i, I love barrel strength whiskey yeah, yeah, for just what comes out. So tell us a little bit about the new riff pick, because this was your first new riff pick. I haven't done one of those myself. I've done a lot of barrel picks at uh, many places, but not new riff yet. But I, I hear they've got a pretty good program. So tell us about it. Actually, it's our, it's actually the third one I've been on. It's, it's my second pick. Your second pick, okay. Yeah, we've done it new riff. So, so, you know, we've done it with all the big boys. We've done it with uh, Knob Creek and Woodford and Wild Turkey and, uh, Buffalo Trace, Buffalo Trace, you name it, we've done it with them. But you know what I call is new distilleries that are coming up, uh, which are you know younger than ten years old, which is New Riff is one, uh, Wilderness Trail is another one, and then I'm I'm trying to so it's almost like a whole new uh, generation of distilleries are coming up, and we wanted to we're still trying to educate people about it, so we you know, we're educating ourselves too with, with these new, what I call newer distilleries. Uh, I'm trying to forge relationships with all of them to do single barrels with them, to be one of the first on their list to do uh, single barrels because, you know, I believe in it. I believe in the industry and, and, you know, I don't shun it because it's four years or uh, I embrace it. I, I think that, uh, you know, I don't, uh, get me wrong that sure I, I think growth is great for everybody and and yeah I'd love to see a six year out of them but it it's just not happening right now so so we've always we've tried to forge new relationships with all of these younger distilleries is what I call it just because in in six to ten years you know they're going to be putting out some great stuff they're going to be a heritage distillery and not just a craft guy anymore so that, that that that's part of the, what we're doing now you know trying to forge relationships within the industry. So what's unique about New Riff versus some of the other places that you're used to going to? Well, I mean, they, New Riff talks about being a new riff on an old thing and, and they've got a beer guy who's, and I'm, all their names escape me, but you know, who's kind of their master distiller and just doing things a little bit differently. Uh, you know, I enjoy it. It's, it's, it's kind of a new modern facility and, and they just do things just a little bit different. Like I said, it's, it's kind of a new riff on, a, on an old gig. Yeah, and for those that have visited New Riff, they, they actually don't do it at the distillery, right? They have a second location. Isn't that where they do the barrel picks that has their warehouses and stuff? Right, right. So that, that's, 
you know, it's, it's downtown Newport or whatever. And it, it's just down the street to where, so there, uh, it was the owner of party source, I guess. Yeah. Ken Lewis. Matt, didn't it? Ken um, Lewis. Yeah. Ken, Ken, yeah. Anyhow, he, one of the biggest liquor stores in, in, in Northern Kentucky in which was, you know, Cincinnati area in Northern Kentucky was huge back in prohibition. So it's always been a big liquor center. Um, but got one of the biggest liquor stores up there and, uh, sold it to his employees and started a distillery. And, and I think they're doing a great job and, and, uh, they, they've seen some growing pains because the three or four times that I've been up there and, and how they're learning from their mistakes and, and, and moving forward. But, uh, I think they put out a good product for as young as it is. That's, that's kind of what we're getting at. Yeah, they seem to be dedicated to the quality of things by, you know, holding out to release their own products until it was bottled and bond, until it was four years old. So that's kind of their base. They are going to have products older than that, but uh, they didn't put out anything on their own uh, prior to that. They didn't put out a two-year whiskey or anything like that. They, you know, they put out, they, they source things, which they talked about. They had the brand OKI which uh, they have now discontinued and actually sold off. So someone else has that now. But, um, you know, they always have been dedicated to doing things right, which I think is admirable, their, their approach in this whole thing. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, starting a new company, even if it's, even if it's an old product, like, like, like bourbon, you should think, oh, well, it's easy to get in the bourbon business. It's, it's not, <laughs> you know. Right. So you're going to run into so many issues. Uh, yeah. it's just all these guys have been doing it for so long and, and bourbon was unpopular forever. You know, I mean, you know, since the end of the fifties and sixties, it just killed it. And, uh, we're just now seeing a resurgence in the last 10 years, really. Yeah. How many barrels did you taste on this pick? On this pick, because of the COVID, we only got to taste three barrels, three barrels. Okay. Which normally they taste 10. 10 okay. but it was i think it was 10 may have been less than that but they have a whole list of, of of so they have barrels you can pick from so they've got maybe 15 barrels that you can pick from okay and i think the one thing that i would be critical about is that they give you kind of a menu like their tasters uh write notes on certain barrels and they'll, oh, it's toffee, this one's citrusy, blah, 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 blah. And I really, I don't like any of that, you know, because I, I like to go in blind. We've done all of our, you know, Four Roses has 10 different recipes. We always did those blind. I want my palate to do the work. I don't want to be able to read it and then read into what, you know, somebody, because honestly, you can lead somebody off a cliff. If I tell you, if you know, if I tell this you this one's older riff, than that one, yeah, the, yeah, all those things. This one's you know, higher proof, yeah. It's, it's going to put something in your head, and and I don't want to do that. But so that would be the only, you know, the only uh, drawback that I would have is they give you kind of a menu of what barrels you're supposed to, what you're supposed to be tasting, and and I don't I don't know that I get that. So and and you know maybe I've been in it longer than some people, but. I just have a, a, a certain palette that, that I, I like what I like, but do you actually, do, do you keep any sort of notes with this? Is there anything that people can expect this one to, to taste like or anything like that? You know, I don't, I, I never, you know, every other person I've ever been on barrel picks and I've been on with, uh, I don't, nobody knows this guy's name is Max from, uh, Las Vegas, he was actually uh, Emerald's uh, beverage manager. So I've been on several picks with him and he's got a detailed notebook and he does this and does that. And I just kind of walk through and keep it in my head. You know, I, I just, uh, I don't usually write things down. I'll make a couple of hash marks or I'll, I don't know, some of my notes you just are indecipherable. Um, yeah. But it, yeah. It, I mean, I've been, I've been with you on a pick before at Four Roses and there was eight barrels and uh, yeah, you weren't write down any sort of notes like it tastes like this, tastes like that, but you got to kind of keep track of them a little bit. That's it. Uh, you know, that's the only thing you're doing. Well, so. I, yeah, I'll give it, you know, a, a slash, a hashtag for the nose, 
uh, the palate, the finish, you know, how the mouthfeel is. I mean, I'll make little, just little dots and stars and things. But so, I don't do any detailed notes because I just, it's just what I feel, you know, it's, it's more of a feeling with me. So was uh, Max with you on this pick? No, no. Oh. We, we did a Buffalo trace pick and, and Max is a mixologist. He did some stuff for Sammy Hagar as well. And so at the end of the day, because he was working, I wasn't, I was just there for fun when we were at Buffalo Trace. And, uh, you know, he picked all the spicy barrels and I picked all the barrels that you would sip on is really what it came down to. And, and at the end of the day, he's a mixologist and I'm not. So yeah. we completely picked the opposite barrels. And right. I realized why, because he's, he's going to build all this stuff on, on what he's picking. And I'm not, I'm going to sit there and just sip on it and maybe put some ice on it. Yeah. So was anybody with you on this pick? Yeah, we did. Uh, I took a uh, John Johnson, who is a sommelier, and, and uh, he owns a, a little bar, uh, a, a little shop up the street called the Wine Rack. So he's a retail. Okay. Shop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I sell a lot of my bottles through him, and we do some cross marketing. So as a restaurant, I can put my, um, I can sell my stuff retail at his place. Okay. Uh, so he goes on a lot of picks with me, and what what's crazy is he's a he's a certified sommelier, and and his and, and my palates are different. So we've done three different uh, makers, you know, the forty six staves and all that. We've we've done those, and and it gets really interesting. Uh, and and we've done a couple of new riffs too. So, and it's easier on the budget when I can split a bear with him, and he sells at retail, and both of our names are on it. So. Uh, when you all get the bottle, it will have, uh, let's see if I can get it up here. It will have Bourbon's Bistro and the wine rack on it. But he is a certified sommelier, so I figure he's he's qualified to go. Yeah, just, just down the street from you. So, yeah, he's got a nice little place if you're ever in town. And a pretty nice inventory there, so worth checking out the wine rack if you're looking to do a little bourbon hunting when you're in Louisville. And then stop by and get something to eat at Bourbon's Bistro. and drink or two for sure uh so and i've been on the uh, pick with you before it's a it's a it's an event i mean you when you get a group you tend to make breakfast at bourbon's bistro which is restaurants not open it's a dinner restaurant so it's not open in the morning it's just jason back there cooking for you uh which is really cool and then uh, you know you get either limo or uh, a bus depending on how big the group is and then you go to the distillery you pick the barrels and then you come back and you drink some, some more at uh, bourbon's bistro it's not a bad life. I'll tell you, uh, we should do an event with this group here. Everyone's on here. And then uh, the, the, the qualifier being is we all get to vote on, on what, uh, what we pick, but you get all of our votes plus one. So you would still get to be the final call on the pick. Uh, if you, if we can work out that deal. We'll, we'll, we'll do that for, for everybody here. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> I've heard what Jason does with limos. <laughs> yeah, well, he might leave you. I know that. Uh, so, yeah. 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 So be careful. If he gets bored, he just stick near him because yeah, if he gets bored, he leaves and uh, yeah, you gotta then find your own way, right, Jason? I think it's ADD. I don't know what it is. It's something. I'm. <laughs> I get to a point where I just gotta go. So okay. What's the uh? What's this? Before we open up to questions here, what's the stats on this one? Is it's like one hundred two something proof or something? Yeah, like this that? is uh. This comes in at one hundred two point eight, and it's just over four years old, I think. Yeah. Four years old, four years and two months. Uh, it's called a tiger barrel, the whatever tiger. that means. Okay. And of course they put their, Steve, I don't like it. What? <laughs> I mean, so on my label, my side label, they put their, their notes on it. Okay. Well, what are their notes? What do they say, so, basically? I would say don't read their notes when you get the bottle and figure it out for yourself. <laughs> okay. I, I really would, honestly. Uh, but I will tell you now what it says. Fruit forward, bold, complex, intriguing, apple, honeysuckle, clove, and caramel. Okay. Sounds delicious. Isn't a tiger barrel typically utilizing two different types of staves? Uh, the tiger come from the stripes, the different uh, – the different. I mean, I think, I don't know what the example is here, but uh, typically the, a tiger barrel is, is two different types of staves. 
I'm just not really sure where they get their barrels from, and and I've heard of Tiger barrels, but uh, mm -hmm. I I can't speak to that. I yeah. Honestly, uh, okay. Yeah. That they was... hire they hire better writers than I am. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's probably somebody's gig. Uh, I, that's the gig you want. Just sit there and taste barrels and write uh, honey crisp apple and all that kind of stuff. Sounds sounds pretty good to me. So right. good for that. All right. Uh, we always like to you know leave time to ask uh, you know Jason questions, whether it's about the barrel pick, whether it's about the bourbon industry, his restaurant, people of bourbon. Again, he's literally met everybody. They they all come to his place. I mean, Max Shapiro is a regular diner there. Non-COVID times, of course. So we've got to talk about on some of these things. But uh, yeah, there's, you never know. I can't believe, you know, I, I, I've been in there several times in the, the old Carter brand, you know, Sherry and Mark Carter. They're there. They're there all the time. Are they on staff? <laughs> that, that makes for a rough next day when the Carter's in. It's unreal. Yeah, they're fun. Those guys are completely out of their minds. Yeah. Yeah. One day I had the, the, They're very fun. the PR person for four roses and I got on the list where I get all the samples. Now, I mean, you just can't beat that. Uh, you know, so yeah. Who wins more cards, uh, Jason or me? Uh, uh, probably Jason. I think Jason wins more than anybody. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm close. I, I'm, I'm not bad, but uh, I think Jason is the, is the all-time champ overall. That doesn't mean that he wins every time, though. He, that's the thing with cards. You, you know, last time we played, he, he flamed out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> but, but it happens. It, you got to take chances, and sometimes they burn you. So. Yeah. I got beat with a great hand, though. You have to understand. Right. Uh, what's been your favorite pick? Not necessarily because of the whiskey. So uh, maybe about the experience of the pick, uh, maybe the people that were on it. Uh, there could be several things that contribute to what your all-time favorite pick was, I guess. That's what Mike's saying. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've done so many at Four Roses, and there's what, what I love about Four Roses is, once again, it's the barrel strength. But, but you know, I'm just not in it to, to knock your head off with 130-proof whiskey. It's It's – the complexity of those whiskeys that that make them great because if it was just high proof and hot, I really wouldn't dig it. So what we kind of got into at Four Roses especially is um, those sneaky, sneaky good ones that were 125 proof and you're like, this doesn't even drink like 100 proof. And it's just so sneaky good and there's so much flavor to it. And you know, I, I did several, several picks with Al Young and, you know, just can't say enough about what a, what an ambassador uh, to the game. I mean, to the industry, he was, he was truly a, a good Southern gentleman. And I was very privileged to even know uh, Al Young and, and to be friends with him, to, to say that we were friends. Uh, so, so there's something in Four Roses and Jim, Jim Rutledge is, is a real close friend of mine and I love Brent too. So, you know, those guys have always been good to me. Not so much anymore, but uh, I still have those, those, those are deep in my heart. And then other than that, um, you know, the Knob Creek, we picked a single barrel from Knob Creek that uh, there was three of us sitting around and, and for some reason we had to put the labels on later at a later date. And we were sitting out by the, fireplace uh at bourbons and there was five of us actually and we were putting labels on 200 and something bottles and uh you know the specialty labels that said it was from here and we ended up drinking like three bottles <laughs> <laughs> and uh that was a i mean it, it, it was just so good i mean you don't set out to do that that's what kind of sneaky about bourbon is that you start to tell stories and you know it, it's not like college or something you're you're hammering drinks to get drunk you're just you're just sipping good whiskey and before you know it you've gone through three bottles and you have to get a taxi home or an uber or whatever it is and uh and it, and believe it or not you remember those times because it, it was it, you know it, it it it's close to my heart to, to sit around with friends and that's what to me that's what whiskey's all about it, it, it's sitting around with friends and and having a good time and you and I playing cards and, and, and me just sitting at the bar with people talking about whiskey. It's like, I've never thought 
that I would be a geek or growing up, but um, I think I'm a huge whiskey geek. You know, that's just what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. You were on uh, my all time favorite barrel pick you were on and you mentioned Al Young. He was on there too. I think we had six people. We're doing a total wine pick. We invited you to join us with your expert palate. And uh, at the end of it, uh, Jim, who, who's the lead guy at St. Louis Total Wine, went around and said, what, what did everybody pick? And everyone, five, five. No, it was barrel five, about five, five, five. Went around the whole thing. All, all six of us that were there uh, went around too. And then we looked at Al Young and he had this paper uh, on, the, on the desk and he flipped it over and there was a five on there. And we just went crazy, man. That, 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 was, that was the greatest feeling that we all picked the exact same one out of 10 barrels, including the great Al Young, man. That was, so that was a cool pick. And that, that sold out in like a day. So, yeah, that's an easy story to tell when you, you sit there and tell about Al Young. And people start buying that by the case then. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was great. So, yeah, they just they can't replace a guy like that. I mean, he was, he was, he was something else for sure. Yeah. So, uh, approximately how many different uh, uh, barrel picks do you have right now at Bourbon's Bistro? Well, we just have the new riff right now just because of the COVID. Uh, usually, we'll do about eight to ten barrels a year, different stuff. Uh, I have already picked a Russell's Reserve. It's on the way. Uh, I'm in discussion with Drew from Willet, who, mm. I mean – We've never really had a pick from Willet just because I Tough, yeah. didn't think it was available to me. But um, we're going to do Willet. And then I think I've got a uh, Four Roses after the first of the year and a Knob Creek coming as well. So, so um, you don't have any else in inventory? None of your Wilderness Trail or I don't know, some of the other ones you had around Knob Creek? All, all that's sold out now? Everything's sold out. You know, we try to keep two and three uh, in the building at all times at least. Uh, and it's been mm -hmm. difficult during the COVID times. We were on track to do uh, um, a barrel strength old Forester. And I, like I told them, I don't want a hundred proof. I want a barrel strength or a 90 proof, whatever they're doing. And so they said, okay, well you can have a hundred or a, a barrel strength. And then all of a sudden the COVID hit. And I said, well, I don't know that I can afford it. <laughs> so you better take me off the list. And then now they, they've been crazy with that program. Some people are getting barrel picks. Some people are not or barrel strengths. Some people aren't. So I told him, put me back on the list. We'll see, see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully that comes through. Uh, put in a plug to uh, get the, the Willet. Apparently that's a favorite of Richie's. Uh, Linda's going to be uh, heading your way. Uh, thanks. Uh, Linda, when you go there, yeah, be sure to say hi. Ask for Jason. Uh, he's there literally every night unless something would be very unusual. So, uh, and usually, you know, he's got kids. So he usually gets there kind of, you know, after, after kind of spending some time with the kids. So I look for Jason usually 7.30, 8 o'clock, right, Jason? Is that still the norm or you, COVID's got you working even more now? Or I, I know you had to help out. You had to fill in for a lot of people. Yeah, if I'm in town, that's that's usually where I'll be. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he's usually there right behind the bar. So easy guy to find. Uh, are you going to give us a chance at some of these? Uh, you mean the other barrel picks he's got coming up? Uh, I don't know, Jason, if, if yeah, you want to do yeah, some. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if you want to do some. You know, these, the only yeah. thing that uh, I guess our, our laws are maybe we're kind of uh, skating them a little bit, but they're allowing us to mail them out. I think maybe i don't know but but yeah i mean i'll give uh we will i think steve love i love doing it it's helping both of us out so uh we would we will probably allot so many barrels from each barrel from here on out uh, i don't see why we wouldn't steve do you i no, i love that idea and i'm, I'm in he's so. kind of locked up i guess yeah. And I want to give yeah, Jason be, a plug here too, because Jason actually took a, a leap of confidence with us when we first started virtual bourbon. He was our very first event. He was. Yeah. yeah I think Jason's actually locked up this time. Not me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, so as long as Jason wants to do that, we'll keep doing these. Uh, he gives me a number that we can sell up to, and uh, and we'll do that, and uh, and we'll offer it on on all of the the barrel picks that, that he wants to do. And um, to me, that's a great idea and a great way to get it outside of the market. So you know, these are are highly coveted. 
Uh, somebody asked about uh, Woodford. Woodford's pretty, uh, they hold pretty tight to these things. So, so normally they don't allow you to go outside of what, you know, they sell in the store. So Jason talked about, he got the, the non-chill filtered one uh, several years ago. I don't think they'd even do that anymore, that type of variant. So um, I, I doubt you can do that. And it, again, I, I've only done uh, a couple barrel picks at Woodford myself, but I know that everything was kind of locked in and they, they kind of told you what you could do and unless things have changed and that would have been in the last uh, year here um, that the rules are typically you're buying what's available at the stores. You're going for different flavor profiles, of course, but, it, but uh, uh, even that's a little tough because they do do a small batch for you. So you do a couple barrels instead of just giving you a single barrel. So awesome for doing this. Great ideas. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Jason? Yes. Uh, oh, Would I be able to pick my bottle up and that way you don't have to send it out? Anytime, Fred. Do I have to wait till next week or uh, whenever? Whenever you want to pick it up. All right, cool, man. Thanks. There you go. That's an easy, that's an easy one. Jason probably appreciates that. Just call me. You got my, you've got my number, right? You're locked up. You got, not, you have my number, Fred? Not your cell phone number. No, I the 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 number for the business, but I don't have your cell phone. Well, I can. It doesn't matter. I can give it to you or whatever you want. We can uh, anytime. I mean, I, I'll put your name on it. And maybe call the restaurant and tell them. And when you're here, we'll we'll work it out. All right. Yeah. Let's do that. Sounds good. Easy. Uh, yeah. Even Tim Wheeler up in uh, Alaska. Uh, Kenneth Gaylord. In the last, so we, we people. I just remember one of one of my barrel stories, real quick. Sure. Uh, so, several years ago, we did a uh, what was the whiskey of the year last year? We did a uh, Henry McKenna. Uh huh. So Heaven Hill comes to me and says, "You want to do a McKenna?" I said, "Well, I'll give it a try." So what happened is he brought me like three samples. And we just did this at, at my bar. And he made a mistake by saying that there was eight different samples. And I said, <laughs> and I said, well, I'm gonna have to taste all eight because I'm gonna tell you what. And I said, and I said, I will bet you that when you bring back the eight samples, that none of these three I'm gonna pick. <laughs> so um, we ended up getting a great uh, Henry McKenna. And this is like, I'm thinking five years ago. Mm -hmm. So we had a whole barrel of it and it was completely, totally awesome. I mean, 10 years, hundred proof, uh, just awesome. Great drinker. And uh, so then somebody, you know, maybe a year later tags me or calls me and says, one of your bear, one of your bottles made the secondary market. And, a, you know, I mean, I, McKenna was like 23, I don't know, $30 back then. And it was for like $200 on the secondary market. And I was like, <laughs> you know, that was a great day in my life that one of my barrel <laughs> hit the secondary. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then, and then last year it, uh, you know, it became whiskey of the year or whatever. And so then Mike, who's, you know, my bar manager, love Mike to death. I saw that thing he did on him. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, he says, and you know, Mike doesn't pull any punches. He's like, right. Oh yeah. He'll tell you how it is. Yeah. He's like, this is bullshit. Uh, they're trying to cut us off from getting McKenna, you know, giving us our allotment of McKenna. Cause we, 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 we still sell McKenna, even though it's not our single barrel, we sell, sell a lot of it. And, uh, you know, the, the rep was like, well, you can have six bottles here and six bottles there. And I don't write emails, but I wrote an email. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, you know, you can keep your six bottles because I was buying barrels back in the day. And if you're going to try to chuck me out now, it's like, I'll just sell them something else. Just like I sold them McKenna when I was doing, you know, you guys a favor 10 years, whatever, five years ago. Yeah. So, that, you know, I love McKenna. I love Heaven Hill. But uh, when you get dealing with the distributors a little bit, it kind of sucks. Um, yeah, you know they try to, try to, you know, I mean we you'd be Buffalo Trace treats us like crap. Sorry, Fred. 
<laughs> oh, that's right. Friends like are. I said, I I used to get I used to get seven, ten, uh, the whole collection. I would get the whole antique collection. Now I get maybe one or two bottles out of the collection. Like I haven't seen a William Larue Weller in forever. And and you know, as part of the distributor or part of whoever it is, and they're just I I had it out with one of those guys and I said, I know you didn't stop making it, you just stopped selling it to me. You know, so anyhow, we still sell it here. Still sell it. Okay. What what other questions do you guys have? Anything for Mr. Bronner? Anything for me? All right. What I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recorder, ending the official event. Of course, we do stick around for a little bit here. If you have any questions that you want to do off the record, we'll do that. So we'll say goodbye to our video audience here and uh, thank you for attending.